in Nordic mythology, uh, Loki, who was the trickster god, was always planning to bring about the destruction of the Aesir. The Aesir, um, if many don't know, is this grandois godlike scheme in dealing with Odin and Thor and all of these other gods, which ruled in, in ancient pagan times or were worshipped. And Loki was the cast out. And when he was cast out, he swore destruction on the gods through a means of lightning, fire, and desolation, probably atomic holocausts and a series of other things. One of his greatest feats was to steal the necklace of Freya, who was the goddess of the hunt. And in stealing from her, created a series of events that would even further lead to Ragnarok's outcoming. And I think that people in general often do this in their own lives. They create the circumstances which lead to their own personal travail or downfall, their own personal Ragnarok. And I, it is something in human nature that where we are all possibly Lokis or some kind of thing therein. And, and the development of self-destruction or self-deceit in human nature is very profound and very hard to overcome. For.org, uh, been having an interesting week, a lot of different discussions, uh, a lot of dream interpretation. Um, and today I thought we would delve somewhat into the world of narcotics, even though that name is kind of uh, given to negativity. Um, even from ancient times, narcotics were used uh, to elevate man's consciousness and to see into and perceive other realms or realities of, what, of existence, per se. LSD or some other hard drugs were developed um, by accident, and from that, there was tampering done, which further uh, created mescaline and a series of other drugs. And I don't know the whole long list. There are thousands of different uh, narcotics in our train of thought as a humanity um, and the addiction values to that. But today, uh, to enlighten us on the cannabis discussion that has been going on throughout the United States, which should have probably happened back in the 1969, in my opinion, as opposed to 2014 in a stifled environment, I'm joined by Philip of Illinois Normal, who is uh, an advocate uh, for cannabis and uh, to legalize it. How are you today? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. How long have you been dedicated to this work? Really only for about a year now. Um, I mean, I'd known it, it existed before. I'd known that people were uh, putting a lot of work into it, and I, <clears throat> I only about a year ago started putting a lot of my own effort and money into it. I mean, it's quite a cross to carry. I mean, do you find that you're being, like, attacked or you're sacrificing more than what you're getting back? Mm. Not necessarily. I, I actually feel pretty good about it um, in regards to <clears throat> just my overall stress stress level. It's, uh, concerning that, it's it's pretty low. I I feel like I have a, a pretty awesome safety net and a, um, and a lot of uh, supporting people. You know, who are, who are all all down for what what we do at normal. The the issue with cannabis, or the main argument against cannabis legalization, is that it's a gateway narcotic. Uh, you're at the forefront of this. You've been advocating this. Um, don't you think it's a gateway narcotic? I don't know. I've, I've tried a lot of things, and uh, it started for me with alcohol. Um, so I, I don't. I'm not really. I, I'm not really sure how to compare myself to other people in that regards. Uh, whether or not, you know, um, cannabinoids can lead to different things is kind of a silly question considering it's a vegetable. Um, you know, I mean, does breathing lead to having sex? <laughs> right. You know, does, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it's a, to me, it's a really silly question. I don't know if that's actually... Well, no, that's so, that's so relevant because my point is, is that these naysayers, that's their immediate 
attack. You know, you would think that you would hear that all the time against an opposition of your legalization. I haven't. I actually haven't. I mean, when I was growing up, I might have heard things like that from other kids who'd heard things like that from just really kind of ignorant people um, that have been, you know, bought into, you know, the, the uh, Reaganomics, you know, uh, type of uh, drug war fantasy driven, you know, propaganda. I don't, I, you know, I don't actually know that that's actually uh, the case. I mean, personally, you know, just through knowing people and I, I don't, one, see it necessarily as a gateway drug or two, even see that as being a bad thing if it was the case, you know, I mean, uh, you know, people are going to experiment with their bodies the way they're going to experiment with their bodies and it's none of my business, you know, what you do in, in your living room or in your bedroom or in your life, you know, so um, as far as I'm concerned, it's a civil liberty issue and not necessarily a drug issue. So when these different types uh, uh, use that as an attack, you express that, hey, you know, your law is off my body. Or, and, and I think that's a good, strong argument. I think that's necessary. Where is cannabis at with legalization? Uh, well, federally or statewide? Because we're the Illinois chapter. You're correct. So, and where is it with Illinois, then? So what we're, what we're, we're about, uh, I suppose, maybe four or five years away. I mean, we, you know, we're lagging, I suppose, with the rest of the states and even the rest of the world when it comes to drug policy reform. And uh, um, even though, you know, we have a 58% poll showing, you know, that 58% that of Americans are for full legalization, uh, we're really not as quick as the majority. So, I mean, that's, you know, even though the majority rules, it rules after time, you know. So give it, a, you know, a couple of years of of uh, the work that Dan Lin and Ali Naguib and myself and, and quite a handful of others have been doing in this state for quite some time. Um, it, it, the, we could get it done quicker, you know, sooner rather than later, preferably, but that all depends on the amount of support that we're able to receive and, and work with in the next couple of years, so. Have you gotten any resistance? Uh, surprisingly, mm, no, in a sense that even the resistance that I get is really just, um, it's really just kind of, a, um, you know, progress. It's kind of just a wave of progress. Every bit of, every obstacle that I run into, it, it, it ends up being just a, another tool for, uh, for propelling on the, uh, you know, and, and keeping the, the 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 momentum going. It's really uh, you know I, I'll hear some people argue, for instance, that they think all you know drugs are bad. It's terrible. You know I don't believe in that. You know I've had somebody actually tell me like I think that you're 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 ridiculous. And everything you're fighting for is is just completely wrong. And I said you know well in regards to medicine at least you know I, I said well I mean. I mean, have you ever taken Vicodin? I mean, have you ever taken any I mean, psychotropic medication narcotics? is a whole other reality. It is so prescribed, it's, the, it's making people sedated um, into some kind of therapeutic uh, sell-off of their soul, trade-off. I'm such an enemy of psychotropic drugs. I mean, Oxycontin, the Paxil, you know, all of these types that are really mind-manipulative. Mind and, and so many of them are actually not just mind manipulative, but useless. I mean, uh, in regards to the actual condition, you know, so especially with narcotics. I mean, or, or opioid narcotics, at least, you know, where, you know, you're getting maybe pain relief, but you're not actually reducing the the issues that are causing the pain. You know, where where cannabinoids do. So, um, so as far as medicine goes, with the conversation I was having with that guy, I told him, you know, um, my mom has to get prescribed these these basically heroin de derived drugs these opiates and that make her unable to function she's not able to think you know she's not able to focus and do all the things she has to do during her day and and uh that's really not acceptable when there's an alternative route that's actually much healthier and nat much more natural um and uh you know she could just juice the plant you know apparently you can actually juice the plant without getting high and still get all the benefits which in her case would be inflammation reduction and if you're in if you're you're you know deflating your inflammation if you're taking away the root cause of the problem because inflammation is the majority of where pain comes from in the human body and 
in most mammals, uh, you know, and that being the case, if you're reducing the actual cause of the pain, then you don't actually need all these little other pills that are peddled onto us as pain relievers like Tylenol or aspirin, which is a, which is a synthetic cannabinoid, you know, and it tricks your ECS or endocannabinoid system into believing that it's a cannabinoid so, uh, or, or a, a chemical uh, derived from the, the cannabis plant. So, um, you know, either you're getting the real thing and you're getting it natural and you're getting it so that it's healthy for you, or you're getting some, some, I don't know, you know, sugar pill that, that's good for maybe covering some of the pain but actually not relieving the underlying inflammation. There was a study that came out that said a lot of the psychotropic drugs does lead to heroin use. As opposed to their old argument saying that it used to be marijuana being the gateway drug that would, you know, lead to certain things, it's almost like they've hit the gas pedal at 90 miles an hour introducing Oxycontin into people's lives, which is almost a heroin derivative. I know a lot of heroin users, no, I'm not a heroin user, I know of or have read of heroin users that have, you know, stated that Oxycontin melted is very similar to how they would shoot their heroin. And that just to me seems counterintuitive as a society that would introduce this type of hard narcotic. Do you, what is the use of Oxycontin? Is it just to numb you out, to deal with your depression? Well, honestly, you know, Number one, um, I uh, I don't know that much really about heroin, honestly, which is uh, uh, it, it's it's not extremely related to what I do, but um, I do know um, that you know people have died from it. I know that you know uh, I know that in using it for pain medication, which it's prescribed for. I know this is widely publicized. It's not a secret to anybody. It's it's a you know it's it's a a painkiller they use it after I know I've gotten something after I've been to the dentist and gotten a root canal or whatever you know and, um, so I know it's a very powerful sedative I've had it once when I was really sick they they gave it to me in the hospital when I was just in a dreamlike state for I don't know how long and you know so I I know how it affected me in my mind when the dreamlike state you know at the time when I was under with it you know and and that was pretty fascinating. I mean, I could I could see why some people may just want to be in that state forever, you know, and, and some right. people, you know, and, and we call them junkies or whatever, you know. But um, I I like to think of those people as people that are lacking um, an income of, of empathy in their lives. These people are not experiencing in the real world uh, something worthy enough to where you and I are happy enough to live in it. You know, they're, they're experiencing uh, something that, uh, that is just so amusing to them that that you and I really are just aren't that cool, you know. And and you know that that involves uh, a lack of empathy. You know, we should feel bad for people that that aren't stimulated by the world around them, and we should inspire them to do better. You know, this is not a a prison system issue. This is not something we put people behind, or we should put people behind bars for. But it's it's happening. You know, so in that sense. You know, in a civil liberty, you know, in a civil liberty sense, I, I'd say that, you know, uh, you know, I don't know much about heroin, but I do know that there are a lot of people behind bars for it. There's a lot of people, you know, going through the ringer, you know, and not being able to afford, you know, uh, you know, or get a job or or whatever because of their criminal background that that might have been, you know, non-existent if they had gotten proper treatment, you know, you know, and I don't know if you're familiar with maybe uh uh, the, some other parts of the world, but there are certain countries like Portugal that have actually decriminalized all drugs, and they've taken the em empathic approach to their drug addicts, and they've, especially you know, in regards to heroin, I suppose I just learned recently, they're they're actually allowing them places to safely, uh, you know, use their their uh, you know, and go off into their dreamland or fantasy land or whatever, and use that substance, and they're looked on with empathy, and they're you know they they work the approach of trying to motivate them out of it. You know, and that's and and nobody dies. You know, that's strictly controlled. You know, uh, here, you know, when one of our daughters or granddaughters or friends or relatives overdoses and and passes away because because they were looked at like a criminal instead of like somebody that needed help, then you know we we create this really disgusting you know chain of events in this country, which ultimately is you know 
you know, school, dropout, prison, drugs, street, you know, it's, it's terrible. You know, we, we're, we've created two worlds by making one world illegal and one world not, you know, instead of just embracing the people that we have and utilizing all those awesome resources we have to inspire people, you know. That's what it looks like to me. I don't know if that was kind of what you're looking for. But no, I'm not looking for anything. I just want your <laughs> opinion because the situation with heroin is kind of getting to an epidemic level. And I know we're deviating from marijuana. And marijuana, in my opinion, has nothing to do with heroin. And I do not think that marijuana is a gateway drug to heroin. It has many beneficial uh, aptitudes to it, which we will discuss. But in returning to heroin... Uh, these people do uh, seek the escapism of reality. Something within the drug brings them out of what is real, and it definitely makes them into different individuals they wouldn't normally be, where they're just thieving off a lot of people and becoming criminal elements. Well, I've also and seen it's, that. And it's unfortunate. And I mean, I don't, and I could see that in that country, Portugal, that they would have that way around it. But I think with our population in the United States, it'd be too hard to do. Well, I've, I, you know, I, I also don't want to support the stigma of, you know, everybody that uses heroin as a junkie, that somebody is not, not able to function in the same world and reality as us, because I don't necessarily buy that either. I've spoken with many creative people who had used it uh, to inspire the creative, creative process, who have brought back the things that they, that they found in their dream world and, and integrated it into their reality. And they've made something beautiful from it in their life and their families' lives. And, uh, you know, so I, I want to look at both sides of drug use in general, too, because, uh, you know, there are people that get caught up on too much of anything. And like in Amsterdam, you're considered a junkie if you use anything too much, food, sex, uh, drugs, whatever it is that you're doing too much of that's distracting from participating in the, in the rest of the world, is you're considered a junkie. So I don't want to support the stigma that's, a, that's a, been associated with drug addicts, especially heroin addicts, for however long, because I don't necessarily think it's a reality. I don't think that we're looking at it appropriately. So, I, you know, I just want to be To be labeled clear. a junkie is harsh, but it's right away what a society does. And I think that has to do with your lack of empathy, but it's very hard to be empathic with some of this. They are sort of destructive. It does create a criminal element. And even, you know, the cartel issue that is going on uh, in Mexico is a transient uh, country that has a lot of drugs coming through it. It's really wrecked that country. The greed and the forces involved in that. Narcotics, wouldn't you agree, does have a dark side to it? It does when you create that second world. We, ha we have a second world where... Uh, where crime is, is propagated by, by uh, an illegal market. This is simply, uh, this is actually simply fixed. You know, um, if, we have, uh, if we have laws here that state that we can't manufacture and, and supervise all the, reg all the regulatory processes that everything else in this country has, from food to other medicines and all these other things, and, and, uh, and, uh, then we are creating a market to be cre uh, in another country where it's not where it's not so strict where they can thrive off of our laws and make a hundred you know so much of a higher percentage off the drugs than we would make here just just keeping the money here and growing it ourselves or, or, or manufacturing it ourselves and 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 teaching people how to how to use it responsibly or not use it at all i mean uh, this is the way most of the world has always functioned, you know, where, you know, you're taught responsible use. It's a family and a cultural thing. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a criminal justice thing. It's not something that should, you know, that, um, that should be so taboo. It's something that should be treated with dignity and respect and, and uh, given the proper discussion in the family. Not so, you know, but now, because we've created an illegal market here, we're welcoming people to fight over extreme uh, amounts of of um, of money and riches that, that can be made off of off of supplying something that's illegal to someone who ordinarily can't get it. When I was in prison, I had to pay. You know, if I wanted to, I could have paid eight dollars for one cigarette. You know, it's it's you're not supposed to have it in there, but you can even get it in there. That's a medium maximum facility. You know, I mean, if you can get drugs in prisons. You're not going to stop drugs from getting here. You need to, you know, treat it with respect and treat it as an issue that's that's uh, that deserves more empathy and not something that just needs to be turned away from and shunned. So, uh, and I know, um, 
I mean, there there is recorded usage of of drugs throughout every class, throughout every civilization. The, you know, they had they had opium opium pipes in the pharaohs in the pharaohs' tombs, and I mean, this is uh, you know whether you're using it for you know creative purposes or for escapism, you you know it's your business, and you deserve to do it safely. You know, you deserve to be educated about it and and know the properties of. Of uh, of different chemicals with your body because you are in the same boat as we are. I'm in the same boat as everyone else. We're in this together, you know. And if uh, you know we're gonna just turn away from everybody that makes a mistake, you know, we're we have a long, hard road ahead of us, <laughs> and not necessarily mm -hmm. the healthiest one. The decriminalization of drugs would knock out a lot of the cartel and a lot of the violence. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they don't want. You you. I think not you, but in 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 a government standpoint, there is huge opposition from the cartels with invested amounts of money to keep it illegal. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that, but it's the truth. The drug war is a, a created thing, actually, by the organized crime, in order to keep their it under in their own personal form of regulation. Uh, the secrecy around the Zetas cartel and a series of other things that are motioning in in, uh, in Mexico, which is what honestly is the primary source of America's uh, drug trade, um, is what they desire to do. You, I think legalization will knock that out. If legalization happens, we would start all this, stop all this nonsense of the criminalization of the narcotics, and it would really free up our prisons for people that really deserve to be there. I don't think the rapist should do five years, and the, you know, the narcotic user get five years as well. It's just it's clogging the system, and it's it's a constant within America, and it's not slowing down. They're making money off of it. They're making money off the prosecutorial aspects of narcotics. And, and I think it's going to continue to be that way. Um, I personally don't do drugs. It's just my own personal preference. And as we had spoken about, um, you, you also believe that no one should do drugs. Or that, no, that, you, that people should be allowed to do what they want to do in their own choice. And I totally agree with that. And I think the government needs to get out of the way. But I also see these other angles from these higher elements, these cartels, forces within government that want to keep it this way. They want to keep it prosecuted. And well, you know, and, and part of that is just to say it's, it's the age-old story of, you know, somebody achieving their position or, or, or have achieving what they've worked so hard for and then not wanting to let it go and not wanting it to be a thing of the past, which unfortunately... I, I feel for some of the people that have made a, a an extremely large living off of drug tests, for instance, and you know stuff like that, where you know their their business will be negatively affected by legalization or even decriminalization of other drugs and stuff like that. You know, I can see how you know if there will be a few people who will suffer from this shift, and they'll have to change, they'll have to get out of bed, and they'll have to do something else for a difference. And it's really unfortunate that that oh my, you know, somebody's gonna oh just ruin their day they're going to have to do something else you know i understand like that's a tough thing it's not it can be made it can be mocked and joked of but the the reality is is that you know um the rest of us are not going to put up with uh with draconian laws the rest of us the majority of us are not going to put up with things that ultimately hurt us as a single organism and um you know if um if you know i understand well people could be kind of um maybe not to I can see why people would not be very enthusiastic about changing the laws or think maybe they have the power to do it because you know they feel corporations are in in charge and and for I you know with respect to uh, a lot of people's concerns out there that may have been the case for some time and that I could see how you know big you know people with a lot of money would not want the the legalization to occur any time in their near future so that they can keep things rolling financially and and the, you know the way they built their life on it uh, and um, uh, we just need to encourage them to to um, to be creative we need to encourage them to uh, to see where the rest of us are coming from and we need to encourage them to um, to use the creativity that they've been given as a human being and 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 come up with something really useful for our planet you know come up with something uh, you know 
that that doesn't hurt me and you, you know, and and that doesn't ha- make us stop and wait five or ten years for the, you know, for people who to evolve. Let's not do that. Let's let's just do the right thing. Let's let's uh, you know make nature nature legal once again, and and uh, let's leave it in the hands of communities, families, and cultures to to uh, to bring about the you know the the positive change in the way we look at, at substances uh, and and teach that teach people how to use them responsibly or not at all depending you know it's you know the prohibition aspect of marijuana is making people rich the drug trade is making a select few very rich they are really going to put up a lot of opposition when push comes to shove and a lot of this uh, anti-drug advocacy issues are really developed by these organizations and people have no idea. I want to point out to that um, because it's very important to me and it's something I hear a lot from people is that, is that they feel really belittled by the amount of money that's swinging against legalization. They're really, um, they're really worried about it. They're just overwhelmed by it. And, and and generally would rather shy away from the issue than speak up and, and as a proponent for for legalization and, and i always tell them the same thing man you know um we have to make this uh an issue about about people about humans and not about m- money and 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 laws you know ultimately changing the law is necessary and in order to do it we have to make it about people you know and and it, it was made clear to me a few weeks back when I spoke with one of the legislators who is not in uh, not in favor of what we're up to, and um, and I told him a little bit about my experience with drug laws and how they've affected my life, and I asked him what he thought about broader drug policy reform, and he said, you know, I haven't thought about it. He looked at me in the eyes and he really and he told me he just hadn't thought about it. So, so my motivation and and uh, you know what I'm working on is being able to bring down carloads full of people who've been affected by the drug war, who are willing to make it a human issue and for, and and leave the fears of you know who's fighting against us at home and and come out make it a human issue sit down with the legislator that's you know that represents their district, sit down and 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 share a little bit about their story you know and. And how many people I can introduce to this guy and, and all the other people down at Springfield in, in Illinois that, that are in charge of making our laws on behalf of us. Um, but, um, the, you know, how many, however many people I can get doing that, uh, and the faster I can get them doing that, the quicker we can change the laws. Because, again, this is a human issue. This is about culture. It's about, it's about family. It's about, uh, it's about being human, you know, and, uh, and about doing the right thing. So uh, if that's the case... Um, which it is, I firmly believe, then, you know, uh, it won't take long to get people out of their beds and, you know, in front, out from out of their TVs and, and uh, you know, their daily routines and, you know, come out, join our fight, and, and, and uh, you know, we got room in the car for them, you know, and, uh, you know, speak their mind. Uh, tell, tell the legislators what they would tell me every day, upside, downside, left side, right side, about what they think about legalization and why it's so awesome, because I hear it from everybody. I'm, you know, uh, I'm on the front lines for this, and and I hear it every day about people's complaints, about what they think we should know, about why they, why we should speed things up, and then, you know, and then as soon as you know, you hand them an opportunity to help out, they're not, they're nowhere to be seen. So, uh, you know, if we just, you know, re- I mean, I'm representing a lot, a large number of people, you know, and and when the average person goes into a legislator's office. They assume that you know you're speaking on behalf of a thousand people because they know everybody's not an activist. They know everybody's not going to leave, you know, take the day off of work and come down to Springfield and see them. You know, they're assuming uh, that you know uh, that when we bring people down, that's a, that's a lot of people representing. And when I speak up and say something, they have to expect that I'm representing a, a bit more than a thousand people. You know, because I've talked to at least a thousand people in the last couple months alone. Uh, you know, in, in my fight for this, and they've all been completely on board, if not, you know, more amused and interested in the topic than myself, and I do a lot of work, you know, so, so it's, a, it's surprising to me, you know, um, how, how many more people there are in this majority than, than are represented by, by the poll numbers, because I wasn't a part of that 58% Gallup poll that was, you know, that showed 58% of people were in support. I, I don't even know if I know anybody who is in that. So, I mean, I don't know where they're getting their numbers from, but it's got to be, it, not only does it have to be larger, uh, but it has to be the just basic, humane 
right thing to do for our fellow man. Let's let's involve everybody in in ev evolution. Let's not just cast people aside because they haven't been educated about the difference between hemp and cannabis and the difference between you know a criminal and 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 somebody who's struggling with something in their life. Let's let's be realistic, you know. And, and there is a difference, Philip, because going back to this criminal and a person who is a use uh, a user of marijuana. You know, if marijuana was legalized, we could tax it, make money as a people, as a public. It would lessen the burden. We would lessen the burden on our prison systems with these frivolous, you know, incarcerations of individuals. You've been buried under that before. You get under these other lawyers and expenses and all this. And it would also stop the hacking down of our trees. I was uh, researching that one field of marijuana could create enough pulp and paper that would last a lot longer and more and create more than an entire forest of trees. There is so many benefits to it. And this is coming from a person who doesn't really smoke. I just don't. It's my preference. But when I look at the brass tacks of it and I see the benefits, the the D powering of these cartels that are vicious, that are destroying the border towns of our America, that are destroying Mexico, which I'm not a party to, but and all throughout the world. That would take a big chunk out of their whole business. And it would also stop this whole dead weight of this created drug war on our side where that money could go back into society and benefit us as a people. This activity that is going on against the criminalization of marijuana is counterintuitive to a society that is trying to function. And I think that it is time to do away with these nonsensical laws that are putting people in prison for five years, that are hitting them with these felony charges, they can't get work, why? Well, because I had an amount over of marijuana, or I was trying to grow my own plant so I could feel better or heal myself from an injury. These things need to end. We're in complete agreement on that. This other aspect of pharmacopoeia is also counterintuitive. We have an entire corporation or corporations and Pfizer and all these groups that are making billions of dollars off us like sheep. Feeding us, going back to what I said, you know, placebos and these Paxils and the Ritalin children. I mean, are you seeing more of that as an effect on society as opposed to marijuana? Well, I mean, um, I mean, like things like Adderall or AKA meth, those have been prescribed for a long, long time. Your parents' generation, my grandparents' generation, they, you know, uh, everybody's familiar that you know with the idea that meth has been peddled uh, you know uh, with prescriptions for a long time now <laughs> I mean that's a uh, that's pretty common knowledge I think and and now you know that we still have nine seven seven or eight nine-year-old kids you know being prescribed meth on a daily basis I mean that's that sounds like a bit of a uh, of a, a bit more of a dilemma to me than you know the, than just some some natural plant that's a vegetable if it's not even heated you know so um, I mean, that to me is just really amusing, I guess. <laughs> That's crazy. You know, my son is hyperactive. Give him Ritalin? Give I mean, I don't have a son and I, whatever, but I'm just using that in the context of an example. Ritalin is like this sedative. I, don't, I mean, isn't there a natural state? And you're saying they're giving Adderall to a child. Why? Because he's hyperactive or in what a child does when I was nine years old uh, you know I was on uh, several different medications you know and you know I my mom was told you know that they would help and you know listening to a doctor you know I you know I'm I, she she listened you know this is an expert or whatever and I took a, like a, a number of different medications that uh, looking back are just um, it's it's just amazing like well, I mean you can you can get much better drugs that just come right out of the earth that actually help you you know like that actually open your mind up to awareness and and teach you how to be you know uh, and maybe maybe assist uh, in in being a more calm mellow person or uh, that's that that's uh, you know just speaks naturally and 
participates naturally in the things around them when you're when you're diagnosed with ADA, ADD or ADHD or whatever you're really just you have a social problem not a disorder or something you have like you, you don't have an understanding of the way things work around you it's, it's just really simply taught with a, with I know in many cultures through you know different uh, through different religions or even just groups of people that have you know have been taught to use medicine from the earth that actually works you know I mean instead of giving a kid meth to take away their ADD problem you might be able to treat them with you know uh, with a, a stronger dose of of some healthier version of a, of a pure amphetamine or something I suppose is you know what some people have been working on and I know uh, you know you could of course cannabis calms me down you know what I mean but I, I when I when I partake and um, I, I suppose different different chemicals are different in different bodies all the time you know it's something that should be discussed between a patient and a doctor it's not something that should be discussed between a police officer and a judge you know it's 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 not necessarily uh, um, uh, rocket science to me to see that uh, you know you can't you can't buy drugs in this country unless it's the the drugs that are peddled and protected by bullies with badges and guns you know so I mean uh, we promote gang violence and and this and this crazy drug war in other countries right here in our own country when we when we say that you know you, you can buy our our meth you know that we call Adderall or whatever you know <laughs> you can buy our you know you can buy our speed you can buy all our, all these things and and not be socially ridiculed or or even put in prison or punished for it but as soon as you try to grow your own and sidestep, you know, paying me, you know, we're going to we're going to come in, we're going to take your children. We're not going to let you live certain places. We're not going to let you talk to certain people. We're going to separate you as another class altogether, you know, as a criminal, you know, and and um and that world, you know, I mean, considering we've created so many criminals, we haven't actually had more criminals than other countries, but we still incarcerate twenty five percent of the entire world's prison population in this one alone. We only have three hundred some some odd million people here, you know, so uh the fact that we're we're criminalizing that many, we've created a whole culture now, you know we've created an entire culture uh, you know uh, the people are getting out now every day they're getting out every month and and now all of a sudden there you know you have an you know we who do we imprison who do we stick in a bathroom with another man you know uh, so that they could eat shitty food and 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 just oh and you know go through the ringer you know emotionally physically you know you know and then who are we putting those are our brothers those are our sisters those are our fa those are our family members you know those are our people that you know that had made a mistake down the line and weren't told yes and weren't told no you know with their mistakes and their cockers and their you know when they did something good they weren't they weren't you know uh they weren't said you know oh, good job good job you know they didn't have that you know and and that's not something that that reduces them to a bathroom with another man and bad food that 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 means that you know we we show some love and have some empathy and we work something out we inspire them each other you know we become humans together you know we, i don't know what we where we've got in our minds that it's okay to do stuff like that to you know but we do and this country more so than any other place in the world well prohibition pays i mean it's making the the criminal system a lot of money they get 150 federal dollars for each inmate a day so if I can put you in for say six months on some petty ridiculous marijuana charge you're gonna sit you, that state's gonna make money they have turned it into a business this goes back to what I said in in our agreement to legalization if you legalize it then their business model is over the cartel business model is over they they have lost a big chunk of their money these types of things are actually behind the drug war they're enforcing the criminalization they're putting in they're putting people in because their money is on the line and i, I think legalization needs to happen tomorrow i think it would help with the counterintuitive desolation of our forests because we would be able to produce pulp and create paper that wouldn't end up kill, destroying the very things on earth, trees, that bring us air. 
You could even develop clothing, and I've seen all kinds of other fascinating things they do with it, let alone the healing properties of it. But there are some THC issues. There are some things with it that are kind of addicting. They do have some studies out, but I don't even know if those studies are even relevant. That's news to me. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, they have this because in going back even to what I said before, they create the spin. They'll create whoever they are. I'll tell you who they are. They're the cartels. They're the government business model that has everything to do with incarceration, the, the model of money and the tax dollars that go to. And who else they are are the pharmaceutical companies because it goes back to just what you said about, you know, they don't want to be sidestepped. These three elements are the biggest forces against legalization that exist in the United States today. And until this is kind of behavior is just outrightly legalized, we we're going to be facing this nonsense. And I do think it is nonsense to get a 65, give a 65 pound boy a dose of Adderall that would probably knock out a horse. I mean, that's just insane to me. And they're prescribing this. And it's also with the doctorization, with the doctors just signing off on these crazy, ridiculous you know, prescriptions, and, and then you get a whole model of addiction with that. And they are highly addictive. People don't want to say that, but you actually have this whole thing where you have to regiment yourself off a drug once you start a drug. And they're psychotropically connected to your mind, so you're being affected by this whole sphere within the mental phase of humanity. You know, I'm a psychic, and I... And I delve in a lot of things and I would never touch that stuff. It would so tamper with how my mind would work. It would it destroys focus. You know, it's so chemical. I just don't know. I don't know what they want with it all. But I am Winter Lake at winterlake.com and you are joining the Pentacle Hours. Uh, we are talking uh, narcotics today in the legal lake at winterlake.com. We've been discussing uh, narcotics, legalization, and the uh, types of other drugs um, that are in our culture. And I received an email uh, directed at you, Philip, that says, what are um, your own personal uh, downsides with marijuana? Do you have any at all? I mean, uh, ne Like negative effects? Yeah, I mean, moods or, or something? Yes. Um, well... I suppose if you consider accountability a downside, sometimes, and I know this is, uh, you know, similar to a lot of other people's stories, but it's that, you know, I tend to think a lot more when I, you know, when or if I, I use cannabis, um, you know, I, I tend to be more creative and constructive, you know, I tend to plan ahead a bit more. So, I mean, which is a problem because for my schedule, <laughs> at least, you know, so uh, I can, I end up, you know, maybe uh, doing a bit more than I should if I wanted to, if I want to maintain my level of relaxation. But, I mean, that, that, that can be a downside. Most people aren't really familiar with accountability in their own lives. A lot of people aren't. You know, I run into it all the time where they're, they're uh, kind of just entitled or, you know, don't really think they have to work for anything, you know. And I, I see it all the time, you know, and, and it affects the, the best of us, you know. So it, does, so it doesn't have apathy with you. What it does is it has the opposite effect. It makes you more motivated. It, it's, very, it's very motivating. It's um, in the sense that, you know, I, I, I just start to get more creative. And when I see the way things could be, I'm inspired, you know, so... That's kind of been my relationship, and I know people use um, people use whatever it is that makes them more alive and alert, you know, uh, or you know, or calms them down if they're too they feel more than you know alive and alert is you know than is good for them or whatever you know. So, uh, you know, people have been self medicating and, and medicating their families and cultures for millennia. You know, this is just the way people are. You know, some. Uh, Sometimes I feel like, you know, there's kind of just a natural way about things, you know, uh, between people and animals and the way the way we are here and uh, together that, you know, is kind of acceptable in a way of just dealing with people. You know, there's generally a consensus of what's right and what's wrong, you know. Um, so um, I personally uh, feel like it, it makes me a part of it, you know. I kind of feel like, you know, I'm more connected 
than I normally feel, just, uh, you know, stone cold sober. I could start, fe I, I have a tendency to feel kind of like an outcast when I'm sober, to maybe feel like, you know, uh, you know, uh, like I'm a bit introverted, you know, and, and, you know, I try to do, you know, I like to do things on my own time. And everybody's different, you know, that's kind of the way I am. But, you know, uh, being able to partake in uh, different types of cannabinoids for me actually kind of opens me up to people and makes me more comfortable with just myself and people in general. And, and it, it, you know, to me, it, it just makes me feel that way. I don't really, um, you know, I'm not a scientist uh, or anything like that, but I know that that can't be a bad thing, you know, uh, you know, so from my point of view, you know, from a very early age, you know, knowing, you know, the oppressive laws surrounding it, knowing the myths about it weren't necessarily true, that you just become, you know, I've, I'd heard things like, you know, be, when I was a kid about, about cannabis that was ultimately just really not true, it was blatantly a lie, and I just wanted to get to the bottom of it, you know, I wanted to know why something so seemingly benign could be such a big ordeal, you know, and turns out, like you mentioned earlier, there's much more to it than just, a, you know, a simple fluke in the in the law or something like, oh, somebody, somebody, you know, farted while they were writing or something. There's big and, money involved. You know, uh, you know, apparently, yeah, there's a lot more to it, uh, you know, and that, you know, de uh, that criminalization of the plant is actually... That's um, big money. It's actually re relatively new in history. You know, it's only, you know, <clears throat> a 70-year or ordeal that we've been, you know. Prohibition makes people rich. Yeah. And, and it know. makes cartels more powerful, and yeah. it makes the business of criminalization more relevant. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I think that um, as long as we're, we're promoters of this crime, you know, and, and not promoters of just... Um, you know, being natural and healthy, you know, which is ultimately what I feel, you know, or the majority of people feel cannabis does for them. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it just, it's a bit crazy, you know. You're like one of the few advocates for marijuana in Illinois. Really? I don't really know of any <laughs> other organized groups. I mean, I was going to have somebody talk about it, I was trying to contact some other one, and I don't even know their email bounced. It's like interesting. I, I mean, I think there's, you know, there, there are. Where are we at with it? There I mean, are so many you people. seem to be very active in Springfield, and you're working with the politicians. And we're, um, we're working on making sure other people get involved too. You know, and it's, uh, you know, I'm, I guess I uh, myself. Um, is one of the few who are actively, you know, involved, uh, you know, at least in Springfield. But there are a lot of people that still pick up the phone and call their legislators and, you know, are a, part, a big part of the community and how this is working. Is that even effective? That's very, that's the most effective way. The most effective way uh, for us to operate, you know, in the sense that, you know, I mean, within the system that we've built, okay, so keep in mind that this is how it's, it, it's meant to operate, or, uh, operate. You're supposed to speak with your legislator and let them know what you feel about laws. That's the way the system was designed to work. But do they, don't they just not listen? Absolutely you know, not. No, no, I mean, they, they can't afford not to listen because we're the reason they're in office. Okay, so, uh, you know, if, if a certain number of people think that somebody should be elected, elect them, and then they're there doing their job, uh, it's, the, it's the duty of the people that got them elected also to make sure that the laws that they're either uh, working towards or working towards ending are appropriate. Okay, so it's up to us. That's us. We're the people that put these people in office. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, ultimately, if you feel hopeless or you feel like the laws are just never going to change, it's pretty much because you don't do anything, you know. And so, uh, you know, um, I hear it all the time, and that's what I that and 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 that's what I counter with, you know. And it's either going to inspire somebody to do something, or it's going to just put them in their place and let them know that you know let the big boys do their work, you know. So, at the same time, there is a lot of stuff that can be done that's really simple that people can participate in that I commend, and that's just picking up the phone and call, or, or setting up an appointment and going to speak with their legislator. You know that that is that is exactly what needs to be done. That's exactly the method to go about doing it because in Illinois we don't have referendum. There's no get a hundred thousand votes and boom, it's legalized. That's not how it works. If that was the case, it'd be done by now because there are well over that number of people in Illinois alone, in Chicago alone, who uh, who approve of full legalization. So if that's the case, then uh, we're talking about. Uh, 
what we're talking about having an enormous advantage here. We absolutely have the ability to change the law this year. Absolutely. You know, if people were actually going to pick up their phone tomorrow or going to set up an appointment with their legislator tomorrow, if that was how it were, if that was what was going to happen, then yes, yeah, we could get it done next year. Mm, wonderful. However, uh, you know, people aren't going to just get up and do that. You know, that's the what, apathy that's issue. What, that's what we need help with. That's what I've been working on, on, on kind of just stirring up people to just at least make the effort of calling. At least do that. Set up an appointment. Contact us at Illinois Normal and, uh, and, and, uh, and find out when we're going to Springfield and, and come with us. You know, bring your family. Bring a family member that's been affected by the drug war, you know. Uh, if you're not comfortable with, you know, speaking with people you don't know about it, you know, uh, uh, remember what it means to the rest of us because ultimately we are in this together, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, and, and especially when it comes to things like hemp, industrial hemp, and being able to keep all the money here instead of shipping it to China or, or Canada, that means a lot too, you know, and there are other aspects to this that people should think about and get passionate about, you know, uh, uh, because ultimately, you know, it, it could be a job, it, it's an industry, you know, I mean, it could be a, so many different things. I mean, the doors of opportunity really open if you get creative, you know, so, uh, you know, we're in this together, we'll help you out. If you don't know what to say, you know, or if you, if you, but you're inspired, you know, we can help you with information. We can point you in the right direction. If you're a medical patient that's going to qualify, we might be able to help you get a doctor that'll talk to you about it, that, you know, that are, that's willing to learn about it, you know. We have a lot of opportunity here, and we have a lot of momentum right now, and I feel we have gotten a, quite a bit more support than in the past. You know, I mean, we have people that have been willing to, to pitch money out of their own, pitch uh, in out of their own pockets to pay for an apartment for Dan Lynn and his and, and, and his lady to be able to stay in Springfield. That's amazing. That's more than I think we've ever had. Uh, to keep a camp down there. Yeah, to keep a, you know, to keep a, a consistent, you know, uh, Dan Lynn in the legislator's face about, you know, hey, this is what we're working on. This is a lot. We got a lot of people introducing the public to them and, 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 and letting them know, you know, that, that there really is a number of people that are concerned about the way this, the drug war has been carrying on and affecting our community. And uh, that's, that's what I'm really interested in doing, I know. And, uh, and I mean, I've only been doing it for a year, you know, so uh, it hasn't, it had, it's costed some out of my own pocket and it's costed a lot of time, but it's been well worth it. It's been just. Well, it's been a big sacrifice. Such a part. learning experience. I it's mean, really you're... not so much a sacrifice as an opportunity because, I mean, I've, I've, all the little jobs that I have gotten, I've gotten through, you know, throughout the community, you know, all the, you know, anything to keep me afloat and keep me alive has all been given right back to me, you know, so uh, I'm really grateful to be able to uh, uh, play a part in it, and uh, and I'm really uh, really excited about the people who are going to come on and make this and make this really happen here in the next couple of years. I'm really excited to meet all the all the, the faces of reform, all the all the faces that represent civil liberty, and you know and uh, and I'm really excited to be a part of it with all these good people, uh, you know, and, and really make the change. Uh, there was a question. Um, you mentioned referendum. It's, can you explain what that means, as opposed to? Well, if you have, you know, if you have uh, something in place where, in order to change a law, all you have to do is get signatures for it, then it's worth, you know, it's worth a certain amount of money to be able to do that. You know, like uh, generally speaking, everybody's seen the people out collecting signatures and stuff. Generally, they get like a dollar per signature or something. You know, those are. People get paid to do that, you know, and uh, and it could be worth doing here, you know, to fork up a, a hundred grand, you know, uh, get a, raise a hundred grand from the public, you know, start a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo or something, raise the money, you know, pay to get those signatures, and then have the law changed. That that's kind of cool, uh, and at the same time, you have to deal with the downside that you know people can really instate some of the silliest laws, you know, I mean, so, I mean, with, 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 I, I could see kind they of can. why Illinois doesn't promote that type of type, type of system, because, I mean, I mean, you can get 100,000 signatures to, to agree that, that, uh, to agree that Christopher Walken is God or something, like, there's, like, a literally, I mean, just the strangest things out there that people are interested in getting done, and, you know, and that might be funny and, and good and stuff, you know, and humor or whatever, but it, it doesn't promote what we want, and ultimately that's just the right thing. You know? And Illinois law doesn't allow referendums. No. So they're done by votes of the 
uh, different politicians. So what we need to do is actually, uh, you know, in, in Illinois, how it works is what we have to do is we have to get, we have to get a bill. We have to we have to put it through the House Committee hearing, which just uh, basically, you know, there's a few people from both sides that that you know agree or disagree on whether or not that bill should even go to the House. And then if they say, you know, this is worth looking at a bit more, let's we'll send it to the House. They send it to the House. The House votes on it. If they think that it's worth it, if they think it's, you know, it, it looks good or they think it's feasible, they pass it up to the Senate committee. Not the Senate yet. It goes to the Senate committee. And then they just get together. They decide, well, is it something that, uh, you know, we should send up to the Senate, uh, you know, and, and hear it there? And if it is, they send it to the Senate. This is what we went through with the medical bill. This is what happened with medical uh, cannabis in Illinois. The Senate, uh, the Senate committee passed it up to the Senate. The Senate passed it, went up to the governor, boom, he signed it, it's done. You know, we have a direct role in that as a, as a public, as a community, uh, through talking with those legislators, those people in the House and the Senate along the way, and making sure they understand how the public really feels about it so they think that they're not alone, you know. None of them are going to put their name behind something if they think that they're the only person out there that's willing to stand up for it. That nobody wants to be that, that that you know that one guy voting for something that doesn't exist. You know, nobody wants to be that guy, and understandably so. In order to get the law changed, we as a public have to get together. We have to agree that this is something that we that, that's worth fighting for. We have to pick up the phone and we have to dial. I know some people pick up the phone and dial every time they're told to donate on a on an infomercial. You know. And, how come we haven't gotten the support for medical or for medical cannabis until now? I don't know. How come it's taken so long for legalization? I don't well, know. Well, you were behind that. I mean, you've been working on this. I, only for the last year. Dan Lynn's been working on this for over a decade. Ali Nagib has been working on it for about three years. But you're all with Illinois Normal. Absolutely, yeah. And there are other organizations, um, you know, that had to do a lot more with the medical bill than us. Uh, well, not necessarily a lot more, but it was really a team effort. The Americans for Safe Access was strict, is, uh, works around strictly medicinal uh, uh, cannabis. Um, you know, uh, they had a, a big role in it, and they helped organize a lot. I know there was somebody uh, from Marijuana Policy Project, uh, you know, um, has been extremely active. That was their bill, actually, the medical bill that we all supported. Uh, you know, so it has been a team effort. We're not the only ones out there doing it. Uh, I know there's a, a handful of people that attend regularly to our Illinois Normal meetings here at Multiculti the first Wednesday of every month. And we're actually about to have our last one of the year tonight. Uh, you know, and, and that's that's pretty exciting. You know, it, it allows for a platform for people to step up when they're ready. It allows for you know a platform and a place for people to come out and, and become a part of uh, of something bigger than themselves that they have a good shot of winning actually, and, and and without that much of a fight because it is something that just makes sense. You know, so um, it's not like we're going to be, you know, attempting to to get a unicorn you know, as the next president or something. We're, you know, we're actually just doing something that's right and that's, you know, going to happen eventually anyway, so. You do feel it will. Um, how close are you to legalization, do you think? Well, like I, like I said before, we're within four or five years. It could be faster, though. Man, we that's get, so slow. We could get it done faster. It is. It's, that's ridiculous. Well, you know. How what? do you know it's four or five years? Because you have certain because, politicians that are in straight opposition. Uh, well... It's because we ultimately have to make the law change. It's not just going to be something that legislators think is common sense and go ahead and do. If that happens, you know, ultimately the bill could get repealed. I mean, you know, there could be some... Uh, edu there has to be education along the process. In order for things to change for the, for the good, I mean, we have to educate people on why it's changing and not just change it for them. You know, so ultimately uh, looking at it from a perspective of a legislator, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not just going to instate something because I think it's the right thing to do when everybody else is against me. Obviously this isn't the case now. We have a large percentage of Americans think it's the right thing to do. However, those things have to be, I mean, that has to be worked for. I mean, that has to be, you know, somebody has to go in there and say something, you know, on a regular basis. A number of people do, you know. And, you know, you got, you got Dan Lin down there, sure, every day. That's great. But that's one person. You know, they don't know how many people he's speaking for. I mean, that because uh, you know there's just not enough people speaking out. That's that's why. That's it. That's why it's going to take so long because people are not going to 
put down the remote to the TV. And I'm disappointed go, hearing that. I'm take the day off of I'm work. disappointed hearing that. It takes you and me, it takes me and, you know, and a few others, you know, to, to be able to stir people up and say this needs to be done. Give me a day. You know, give me one day. Take it off of work. Schedule it with your boss. Say, I'm, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm taking this day off for myself in four or five weeks. And come with us to Springfield, and we can do this a lot quicker. It would lessen the burden <laughs> on Illinois tremendously, who is in the last state of the union tax-wise or burdened by these horrible other debts and things, and it's statewide. And people don't realize that. When you're looking at Detroit, it's a city within a state. But Illinois, as an entirety of a state, is completely, almost basically bankrupt. Something needs to happen within four or five months to lift this tax burden. Yeah, and Maybe if some yeah. of the listeners out there, the 833,000 residents that we possibly reach, and those that are streaming with us online through Global Reach at QUR4.org, or no, it's QUE4.org, I don't even know my own stream, neither here nor there, Possibly you could want to make the call to try to reach these people. Referendum, I think, would be much more necessary in this kind of thing, because not necessarily. That costs. I mean, we could actually. I mean, that that Four if it costed years. us if it costed us a hundred grand to get a hundred thousand signatures, that wouldn't be as worth it as uh, paying ten grand to a, a professional lobbyist and and you know got it got it done that way or a, or a team of professional lobbyists. We could, I mean, with a much, much smaller uh, budget, which we've been operating on a completely shoestring budget. I mean, from the, you know. You know. Uh, and, you know, you know but one thing i got to call you on, Phil, um, why is it necessary to give someone a dollar for their signature? Why can't they, you're, you've mentioned this several times. This is times. a good question. Um, I, some people actually get paid. I actually went out not long ago and did it for I free. I know, because you're throwing out this 100,000 number, and, and we don't have referendum here, and it's kind of, I guess, an obsolescence argument. But, I mean, is it something where you just have to give up a buck that's, you know... It's just funny to me how it works, uh, you know... Because uh, ultimately, there are people who get paid to collect signatures for re-elections, elections. That's and um, here in the, Illinois. You, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You see it. Yeah. No, that's the thing. You go on Craigslist and get a job doing it tomorrow. Yeah, that's a that's a real thing. You know, people. Politicians yeah. are paying people our money. Let's not forget whose money it is. The taxpayer just, you know, dollars to get and obtain signatures. Uh, well, that's not necessarily true because technically their campaign funds have to be separate from their go their government jobs. So uh, that's not technically true. And uh, however, I mean, there are resources that are going into getting signatures. You know, if I'm taking a day off of work, that equals cash. You know, in and, and most people's languages, you know that that. You know, taking a day off of work to row, to roll up a bunch of signatures costs money. That costs gas money. That costs you know that costs stuff. You know that that dollar a signature is almost really just compensation for all the time you took off of work, really. You know, and uh, or whatever it is. You know, and and just to stand around and do it. You know, uh, that's uh, that's just not necessarily the best approach. Uh, you know, I feel like doing it organically, really making it a, a more of a human issue, disregarding money altogether and just making it like, you know, this is what's right, this is what's going on, this is so-and-so, this is how they've been affected by the drug war, this is their family, this is another person, mm -hmm. you know, and then duplicating that process is not only much more effective, uh, but, it's, but it's also um, much more meaningful. If you get something done that way where it's organic and that it's taken time to educate people on the realities of cannabinoids and and uh, the way that you know they've been used throughout you know centuries and you know and throughout cultures and civilizations you know the way that the way that we do that um, is by getting people involved it's not necessarily just getting them to donate which is one cool way to be involved you know an extension of, of you know your love or passion for the issue that's pretty cool you know uh, but actually stepping up and getting involved, opening up your mouth and, and being a part of the process and, and being a part of the community, the global community that we are, you know, especially right here in Illinois, that's that's even easier to be able to do so. I mean, other states have it already. They're enacting and they're installing and they're putting up things. I'm disheartened that here to hear that Illinois is four years behind. That's, that's an eternity in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that changes. 
Well, Phil, thanks for joining us today, yeah, and uh, we've good. been discussing narcotics. I'm going to move on to some dream interpretation. This is Winter Lake at winterlake.com. Is the world of mankind created with heavens and the sea in the body of Ymir? Midgard was the middle of the universe, located between the world of light and Muselheim, the world of mist, Niflheim, and was connected to Asgard by the Rainbow Bridge Bifrost. The Midgard serpent was a serpent and offspring of Loki and his wife Angerboda that lay in the lower region of the sea coiled around the world and holding its tail in its mouth. Tor tried without success to catch the serpent from Hiram's boat, but the giant thwarted him at Ragnarok. Tor faced the great Midgard serpent again and struck him down with an infallible hammer, but fell dead himself. This duality also within humanity goes back to destruction. That Events that correspond to one another can be flashed upon itself in bringing about destruction of each other simultaneously through action. Two cars crash, both parties within the cars are dead. You have two opposing forces in causality, they bring their, their own demise down and there's no victor. That is really what I'm kind of gleaning from some of the symbology of Ragnarok and the symbology of Nordic myth and reality for me personally. And in looking at that, with that dream that I had yesterday or several days ago about the hag in the woods, and you may be wondering why I'm discussing Nordic myth, is because... I had the recurring dream again, but the hag was also present with what I believe to be some kind of force or Nordic force being these other Norn element shadows within it. So as I'm seeing this hag in the woods, now we have entered these three Norn myths, which are the fates themselves and fate and causality, meaning that the Norns weave the entirety of the universe, and they dictate how things will play out in one's life from the expanse of humanity and down to the individual himself. The symbols in this recent recurring dream were more of the same, the water, the this dark forest, and this hag, and I had mentioned yesterday that maybe kiss the hag and she would turn into a beautiful girl. Well, I tried that in the dream, and what occurred was she didn't turn into a beautiful girl. She actually vanished from my sight. So I banished the hag from my own dream, but the shadow creatures, the Norn element, uh, remained. So now this hag force is diminished or gone, but I have these shadows, these figures that I am yet to reconcile as to what their purpose might be. And it's hard to understand what that purpose is because I did actually feel threatened in the dream at this stage. It felt more like a nightmare. And that's rare for me because I don't really have nightmares. And as I said, I like witches, but this witch rubbed me the wrong way. And you know, people do in general, and in, you know, it could be seen as I'm facing my fears, or facing myself, or I'm looking at myself to be a better person, or things that have vanished, or things that are appearing again in different forms. And it's kind of eerie, and I don't know where it's all going, and it also could just be lucid, because I am a fantasist. I, I do a lot of film writing, so I'm always in my head. I'm always constructing and building film and constructing and building screenplays. And you're, you, you know, there may be even slight phases of schizophrenia that go on during the interplay of creating a film because you're constantly talking to yourself in the banter of that reality of what the film is and the structure is, how it predisposes throughout its uh, tiers of existence or rising and falling action within the film itself. It's a screenplay. And I received 
an email response in talking about um, in talking about the hag more so. And a person said to me that I need to look at the hag more, what the symbolism was. And I think I will. I have my own intuitions on what it was, uh, that I may need to be a nicer, more friendly, more cuddlier person. And it's something that I would like to do. But I also received an email that said again that's kind of leaning towards the fact that the hag, the night hag within the dream is an enemy, an outside force that is gearing up magically against me or a force in that way. And I'm not trying to be remain paranoid on that and I, you know, I'm not really thinking I'm cursed or whatever and I don't think I am. I mean, curses do fly around in this profession. But in this actuality, all angles are going to be analyzed. And to end my show, I'm going to interpret possibly one more other person's dream. And that's probably the last that I will discuss about my little night hag dream. Unless it recurs, and I don't think it will, because I kind of think I've got it solved. Um, the final conclusion is that I need to be a better person. That I need to stop being so crass and start being more cuddly. And I know that's kind of silly, right? A cuddly occultist, I guess so. But um, this other dream has to do with a woman who is constantly in her dream feeling at, uneased and sees herself asleep on a bed within the dream. And while she's asleep on the bed within a dream... Uh, there are others sleeping in a room around her, but not near her. They're enclosed by glass of some kind. And she's trying to make her way from the bed to some kind of escape into this vast expanse of a place. But she keeps running into glass walls. And there are other like images of demons or some kind of force trying to come in at her while she's trying to get out just as equally as much. And this dream goes on and on for some time, but I think I've got the gist of it down. You're clearly um, trying to escape something from within yourself. Hitting a glass wall is absolute denial. That... You are trying to escape from yourself or something that you are doing. And as you are doing it, you are even seeing more fear-based things with these demons that are trying to eat you or devour you. And these were things that came in later. They were signaling they wanted her to. But she had separated from the two forces that there was not, that they weren't in the same room from her. But she was definitely trapped. Clearly, there is something that you need to do in order to escape from this entrapment. And it will be probably something where you could maybe lucidly dream and try to anticipate how you could get out. Now, the bed in seeing a dream or someone um, sleeping in a dream, I, that's very rare to me. Because I, I don't really hear a lot of that. I don't, I, I mean, I don't think I've ever really been brought with a dream with a sleeper as a dream within a dream. So I'll have to probably do some later research on uh, what the symbology of uh, the, dream, the actual sleeping inside your dream was. Because I'm curious as to how that was as well. Winter Lake at winterlake.com. It's interesting. I have a Depeche Mode story. Uh, when I was living in Washington, D.C., during the Violator tour, uh, a friend of mine named Kyle, who was a roadie at a uh, big uh, stadium place where they were playing at the time, said that David Gaughan is going to be at what is known as like the Bourgeois Pig. Um, that's funny this cafe um, up in Georgetown, which is like a really nice place. It's fun. It's probably crazy fun. There was no economic downturn uh, in the Georgetown area or Virginia area of uh, Virginia. Those people are filthy rich, and it's just a lot of fun. Anyway, so I went there, and I actually got 
introduced to David Gaughan. I got to meet him. He's very down to earth. And this was even during like his pre-drug phase. He was still kind of on the search for drugs. And um, very cool. And we walked around Georgetown. Uh, and he was trying to score. which, But whatever. Not girls, but drugs. Um, and we, uh, or he went, I think he did like, well, was only there for like an hour or something. And then he left town. It was after the show or something. Because he had done uh, Violator, and which I had seen the day before. I think they were playing back-to-back shows. Uh, they had some kind of uh, off off day. Neither here nor there. It was quite interesting to see him. He's a really down-to-earth guy. But we, we shared a uh, conversation about uh, Simon Le Bon. Because... Um, I was kind of a weird Duran Duran, or I went through a weird Duran Duran phase, but I only went through it for a girlfriend. And uh, I had this uh, record, and she's Simon Le Bon was playing, uh, or Duran Duran was playing or something. And she's like, I want you to go get Simon Le Bon to sign the record, because through this same guy, Kyle, who was a roadie at this big stadium where all the big bands played, um, it kind of gave me some kind of interesting access. And I might turn some of that on um, here for Pentacle Hours. I have some friends in Chicago um, that are kind of connected to playouts and stadiums that get me in with a lot of different bands and stuff. But I don't really know if I want to go that direction, but I have the power to do so. But anyway, during this time, um, Duran Duran were playing or something, or Simon Le Bon was there. I don't know if it was even a side project. My memory is vague, but I was sharing, and this was pre-meeting David Gaughan, and I was sharing my David Gaughan, not, I was sharing my Simon Le Bon story with David Gaughan. And I said, yeah, you know, I'm basically, you know, I'm into music and stuff, but uh, I went for, for this girl to get this record signed by Simon Le Bon. So I go up to him, and I see him, and it was all set up. He was doing signings and everything, okay? So I'm not just some guy running in with a record. It was like, they were allowing like 10 or 20 people, and he was signing, and, and Simon goes, oh, I'm only signing for girls today. And I was, like, kind of insulted, but I was, and I'm not gay, and I don't care, but I was like, okay, so now I can't get your signature because I'm not a girl. And uh, I just told that to David Gone. I don't know why we were discussing it. And he said very similar thing, that, uh, that Simon Le Bon had rubbed him the wrong way as well, that... Um, David Gaughan was at an event where Simon Le Bon was. And these guys are way above me, okay? I'm just some little guy who does a radio show, and it may be a finite amount of time, and I write occult books and diatribes, and, you know, I do my little thing in the world. But these guys are, by now, and especially in 2014, rock gods, superstars, whatever. And that's cool. I still think David Gaughan's down to earth, though. Um, but David said that when he had met Simon Le Bon, that Simon goes, oh, you're that guy. I know you. You're that guy. You're that Depeche Mode guy, like in a weird, like insulting way. And um, I was like, wow. So not only did I get the shaft as some weird kid trying to get a signature uh, for his girlfriend at the time, um, David Gaughan got the shaft, and I was like, you got to be kidding me, you know, this guy is like amazing, you know, I mean, the two guys that should ever get along should be David Gaughan, and you'd think uh, Simon Le Bon being in the same genre of time, or what they were offering to the world, and, you know, I still like, I like Simon Le Bon, I do think he's a uh, prick, <laughs> I mean, I guess you get that way when you're a rock whatever god or whatever and you have people that just adore you all the time or something. Um, but there's there's got to be a fine line to your stupidity. You know, you got to check yourself. You got to check your ego at the door. You know, you can't just be all hung up on yourself. And I, I meet that with occultists too. It happens all the way across the board. You got to check yourself. You can't. You can't let yourself get so blown up that you think that you're, you know, whatever. That you're some kind of beyond the fathom of mortality. And it's unfortunate that that had to happen. And I do still listen to uh, 
Arcadia, which is the offshoot album of Duran Duran. And every time I listen to it now, and unfortunately it's kind of clouded by that time, like two decades ago when I was trying to get some kind of signature. But I'm Winter Lake, and you are listening to the Pentacle Hours. And it, it looks and appears to be foggy out. Um, I don't know. It's dark. I didn't give you a traffic report, and I probably didn't give you the right time, unfortunately. But um, you have a good evening.